Hello, everybody. A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I welcome all of you, both panelists and the members of the audience, on behalf of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for the 34th BASL webinar of the Continuous Webinar Series organized, aimed at continuous professional development. We are grateful to the overwhelming response by the legal fraternity, and we are glad to have a viewership that brings together members of the bar, law students, and even other professionals from all parts of the island as well as overseas. So today's webinar is on financial crime compliance with a very distinguished panel of experts covering both the practitioner's perspective as well as the banking perspective. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel of experts who will be enlightening you on financial crime compliance and also welcome them to today's webinar. Uh, first of all, let me introduce to all of you and welcome on board Mr. Nalinda Indathissa, President's Council. He was called to the bar in 1989 and joined the Attorney General's Department in 1990 and was a prosecutor in many parts of the country. He joined the unofficial bar in 1995 and has been practicing as a criminal counsel, specializing in white collar financial crimes, intellectual property offenses, computer crimes, bribery and corruption, money laundering, and a multiplicity of other areas. Mr. Indathissa was conferred silk in 2019. Next, we have Ms. Dilani Suryarachi joining us. She is an attorney at law and is presently the head of compliance of Ceylon Bank PLC. She's also the president of the Association of the Compliance Officers of Banks of Sri Lanka. She is a fellow member of the Institute of Bankers of Sri Lanka and the International Compliance Association of the United Kingdom. She possesses 20 years of working experience in the financial sector, formerly as a legal professional and now as a compliance professional. Let me also introduce to you Mr. Sanjay Ihalagama. He is an attorney at law and a compliance professional, possessing over 16 years of experience. He is based in Hong Kong and has previously worked in several other countries. He is currently the Director of Financial Crime Compliance Sanctions for Standard Chartered Bank Hong Kong. He has also held several senior roles with HSBC, including Head of Sanctions Advisory for the Asia Pacific Region and Head of AML Sanctions in Bahrain. We also have with us Ms. Nishadi Thendako, an attorney at law. She is a deputy director of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. She possesses an LLB from the University of Colombo and an LLM from the University of London. She is currently reading for the Doctor of Philosophy degree at the University of Manchester. And now let me introduce to you the moderator of the day, Ms. Chaya Gunaratha. She was sworn in as an attorney at law in 1991. She has worked in a number of banking institutions and is currently working as the head of compliance, vice president of the DFCC Bank. She has been a resource person and a panelist for many seminars on anti-money laundering, regulatory compliance for banks and foreign exchange. Uh, so that will be your panel today, which will be speaking to you on financial crime compliance. Uh, I leave you in the capable hands of Ms. Shaya Gararatna, the moderator of the day. I hope all of you have a very informative one. Thank you. Good, e Good evening, everyone. I welcome everyone joining the webinar organized by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Uh, and today's topic uh, is financial crime compliance. And this is a very vast area uh, which it has many offenses like frauds, money laundering, terrorist financing, insider dealing, uh, computer crime scams, uh, uh, also uh, information security, bribery and corruption, and many other things like even tax evasion gets included here. The list can go on, on and forever. But we have a very limited time frame with us. Therefore, without much, much ado, I also want to get in, uh, insights of our eminent panel joining here today. Uh, for the listeners, uh, let me, first of all, uh, ask Ms. 
Dr. Nalinda Indati, the President Counsel, to join with us with his insights into the legal framework that governs the financial crime uh, in the context of Sri Lankan law. Uh, he can, uh, he's uh, here to give us some key areas on, team, on the uh, legislations that govern financial crime. And also, sir, if you can give us some insights, the challenges you are facing uh, when uh, you are dealing with certain aspects as a prosecutor in terms of the financial crimes and offenses cases. So over to you, uh, sir. Now, dealing with uh, financial crime compliance, uh, this is actually not new now to Sri Lanka because this came uh, in the, this was introduced in the year 2006 by the introduction of two statutes, that is Financial Transactions Reporting Act number six of 2006 and the Anti-Money Laundering Act number five of 2006. Now, as we all know, earlier when you go to a bank and go to a teller, the teller will simply accept the money that we give. But the, it has changed now because of the coming into operation of these two statutes. Because there is, with the introduction of Financial Transactions Reporting Act, uh, they created the entity called the Financial Intelligence Unit. And with the introduction of the unit, the, the unit was introduced mainly to regulate uh, uh, transactions that take place in, in institutions. Institutions mean banks, non-banking institutions, non-banking financial institutions, uh, all these institutions have to be had to be regulated and data with regard to deposits and transactions had to be collected so all that is collected by this financial in intelligence unit now uh, in, in in the case of banks the there are two kinds of uh, reports that are sent by banks to the financial intelligence unit it, uh, now I think it is uh, if there is a deposit over 250,000 I think it is 250,000 still uh, 200. they will, 200,000 they will yes. question you as to where the funds are coming from sometimes you get agitated the customer gets agitated also when it is asked because we are not used to it very much uh, but it is a requirement people must know that it is a requirement because they have to at least note down what you what we say uh, so, if it is over 200,000 uh, 200, rupees, automatically uh, uh, reporting takes place. Uh, I, I believe it is, uh, it is called the F, uh, uh, FTR, Financial Transactions Reporting takes place. Then if it is a suspicious transaction, that is now if I, in my account, I have about I have been maintaining an account for about five years. In that account, usually the deposits are in the range of 150,000 rupees a month. All of a sudden, I go to the counter and I want to deposit about 20 million rupees. So it's kind of a suspicious transaction. Maybe I, am, I have sold some property and brought the money and handing over to the bank. But I, they will ask questions and invariably this transaction gets reported as, as a suspicious transaction report. But the, I, I should be able to show how I got the money. The idea of reporting these transactions is one needs to collect data relating to suspicious transaction. Second is to prevent, detect, uh, investigate and prosecute offenders because money laundering offenses and terrorist financing offenses, the numbers have increased uh, by many fold over the years. So it is necessary that the, the central bank or the financial intelligence unit maintains a database. So it is with that in mind, this act was introduced and in financial institutions have uh, are obligated to report 
financial transactions to the financial institute uh, intelligence unit now that obligation is caused by the financial transaction reporting act but i i also mentioned about the money laundering act there is an obligation on uh, caused on every person every every citizen i think caused on every citizen uh, with regard to acts of money laundering any person who becomes aware of an act of money laundering ha- is obligated to report that to the financial institute uh, intelligence in u- unit now if if it is found that i ha- having known that there was a money laundering activity and i have not reported i might have a situation where i will I, even i might end up being prosecuted because every person has is obligated to report a fine uh, money laundering activity if it comes within the knowledge of that person now the in practice what happens is lot of money laundering activities take place a uh, lot of uh, black money is being white washed you get dummy companies uh, money is deposited in uh, invested in dummy companies in uh, not so viable businesses uh, like that illegal money is being washed in companies so now if a dummy company is in- incorporated to do wash money all the directors in that company are are risking themselves what is important is when you when you are sitting in the on the board of a company there is a risk for anybody if money and money comes from unknown sources we have seen lot of prosecutions where come where the directors have just lent their names uh, to uh, be on the board of a, of a company and lot of money comes from various quarters and they don't know what the source of money is shareholders come and invest directly they send money uh, sometimes not uh, through foreign foreign investors they don't come through sierra accounts or cia accounts then they invest money and uh, some of the some some people bring money directly and invest in companies so if there is no knowledge of these two statutes if the directors are not properly uh, educated on these two statutes they can fall into a lot of problems they might have to even now they even their accounts could be frozen so any uh, young lawyer or uh, uh, law student should be aware of this uh, these two statutes because uh, when when an account is frozen by the financial institution uh, intelligence unit uh, getting the account opened again for transactions is a very tedious process uh, because uh, now say for instance uh, there is a company without knowing who the other directors are without knowing uh, where they are, where they are bringing the money into the company if i join the company and you find some illegal money coming into the company later and i don't report it also one day the financial Inst- intelligence unit is bound, bound to find it the day they find it they will freeze all the accounts of the company and all the accounts of the board of directors also because they they freeze the accounts that is that is what generally happens in sri lanka in court this is the practical experience i am telling they freeze all the accounts so once all the accounts of a person is frozen that will lead to lot of problems so uh, i think in sri lanka regulatory uh, mechanism is operating fairly well but prosecution uh, investigation and prosecutions don't uh, uh, 
are not carried out so well. Uh, now, I have seen instance, of course, they start off mostly the investigation start off with the freezing of an account. The customer will come to know that there is an investigation conducted by CID or the FIU against him only when they come to come to know that the account is frozen. When, then, of course, a lot of things have happened. Once the account is frozen, they get they panic. Uh, they try to find out why the account is frozen. Sometimes you see your personal accounts are frozen because not because there is some black money has come into your personal accounts, but you are a director of a company to which some black money has come and there is an investigation pending against that company. So this is an important statute. So these two are important statutes. Compliance do take place. But of course, uh, uh, these crimes, uh, the, the unlawful lack, the, the money, the black money uh, that is uh, described under the Money Laundering Act is money derived or realized from certain offenses. Some of the offenses are committed locally, but some of the offenses are committed elsewhere, not in Sri Lanka. The, the, the beginning of the offense happens in some other country. Those are transnational offenses. So investigation takes a lot of time. Say, for instance, cybercrime. So if, if into my company, where I am also a director, some money from a cybercrime, proceeds from a cybercrime comes in, that company, that country will start initiate an investigation. And from that investigation, information will be requested from Sri Lanka. Those investigators will request information from Sri Lanka. So, until in that company gives the green light that we are cleared, there will be a freezing of our accounts done by the Financial Intelligence Unit in Sri Lanka. So that way, companies, because of the operation of these acts, companies could have a lot of problems if they do not exercise due care and due diligence. So the, even the banks have had issues in court because they are very good customers. Their accounts are frozen. Sometimes they have taken, obtained facilities from the banks because the accounts are frozen. Their businesses cannot go ahead. Facilities cannot be uh, uh, serviced like that. There is a ripple effect. So it is a good thing that this is happening because in order to prevent uh, crime, terrorist financing, money laundering activities have to be investigated and tracked. But in the application of this, there are, there are certain problems. Of course, 12 minutes, I think I will get only 12 minutes, so I, it might not be enough for me to uh, wrap up every, all the problems. Uh, so. I would say the most important sections in these two statutes is the sections, two sections which creates non-reporting and offense for a practice, from a practitioner's perspective, non-reporting and offense to the financial institution in the intelligence unit has been made an offense. And the other, uh, other most important uh, section is the section which permits an investigator to freeze an account. If there is ill-gotten money, the black money in a particular account, the, the investigator can request a, the bank to freeze the account for a period of seven days. Or in the case of Financial Transactions Reporting Act, suspend the transaction for a period of seven days and thereafter go before the High Court and get an order 
preventing the 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 confirming the freezing of the account and like when you go to high court that freezing order can even run up to 2 years so if there is black money coming into somebody's account if somebody approaches the young lawyers asking uh, now say for instance good example is no, young notaries uh, foreigners come here looking to buy land they bring money cash uh, but if money is paid as cash the notary has a duty to uh, check where the money is coming from because it can be some stolen proceeds of a crime it can be proceeds of a computer crime it can be proceeds of any other crime uh, therefore we have to be the legal fraternity have to has to be very careful in handling such money so it is always best that we advise them to come through a bank if a foreigner wants to purchase let him deposit money through a bank and bring the money because this then we are uh, the lawyers are aware of the source of course then it becomes the problem of the bank because bank will also have to check where the money is coming from that is what the compliance requirement for the banks are they will have to check and not only check at a particular time of the transaction Uh, sometimes there is a requirement cast on the bank to do a due diligence or the or a scrutiny of a customer throughout his uh, period that he remains as a customer so it's a severe onus on the banks and financial institutions but nevertheless it's a mandatory requirement you have to comply with it uh i I, I think I have used my time. I don't know. That's that's all right. So thank you, sir, for your valuable insights, both from a practitioner's point of view and giving the uh, obligations arising out of the Financial Transactions Reporting Act for the bankers as well as the practitioner practitioners to be careful on the source of funds they are handling with. So. Um, Uh, we have some questions coming on i'll uh, at the end of the session we'll get uh, the answers from the panel on this uh, question sir uh, thank you uh, now i would like to join with uh, nishandi from central bank uh, who would uh, give us some insights on the uh, regulatory aspects of the financial crime compliance nishandi Nishadi thank you uh, chaya yes nishadi uh, welcome nishadi to this seminar webinar uh, nishadi uh, for the benefit of our listeners can you uh, tell us what from the angle of a regulator what have you taken uh, uh, what have you done in terms of regulations issuing circulars as such on to curb this financial crime you know it's a very emerging risk and very uh, new risk with what we have seen in the sector of financial uh, especially in the banking sector as well as the finance companies and also from general public we have seen lot of scams happening they being uh, victims of different types of scams which happens to bank accounts as well so uh, from a, a regulator's perspective Mm, tell us uh, more into the types of financial crimes as well as some regulations what you have issued uh, in, for the compliance of the banks uh, and financial companies as a whole okay thank you chaya i would like to thank the bar association of sri lanka for having me at this webinar as always yes. i express today are my own and not necessarily those of the central bank of sri lanka financial crime is considered a crime committed against a property involving unlawful conversion of the ownership of property to one's own personal use and benefit 
uh, as Taya mentioned, a vast number of financial frauds can be put into this basket. These economically motivated crimes in many jurisdictions, including Sri Lanka, have become a substantial threat to the economic development and the financial system stability. I would like to highlight a few points pertaining to the today's topic from the regulator's perspective. As you are all aware, the global financial crisis occurred in 2008, compelled to bring very stringent regulatory reforms applicable to the financial services industry. It was revealed from the uh, financial crisis that poor risk management, weak corporate governance structures, and non-compliances with rules and regulations had been the root causes for the failures of most of financial institutions. Market abuse, insider dealing, mis-selling, and various other frauds were reported during the crisis. During the post-crisis reforms, financial regulators were forced to think of more prescriptive rules to combat financial and economic crime. When such stringent regulatory requirements are in place, compliance function of a bank or any other financial institution is expected to play a crucial role to ensure effective adherence to such rules and regulations. Uh, regulators always expect financial institutions to have independent compliance functions. Now, if we recall what was the situation in the domestic financial system in Sri Lanka during the period 2008-9, uh, fortunately, since our exposure to international markets were not that significant, we were not hit by the global crisis. But there was a crisis in the domestic financial system triggered along with the collapse of the Golden Key credit card company. It was not a company regulated by the central bank, but they had uh, mobilized deposits from the general public in large volumes. It was an example for a huge financial crime. Along with the failure of the Golden Key Company, there was a panic among financial consumers regarding the legitimacy of companies in which they had invested their hard-earned money. Various unauthorized companies affiliated to one financial conglomerate and individuals such as Sakwiti, Danduam Udalali, Daddy Danduam, and several others were detected by the central bank. Then the central bank brought the Finance Business Act number 42 of 2011 to take action against such unauthorized deposit taking. However, unauthorized deposit mobilization operated as Ponzi schemes is a crime still we see in our country. Despite all the efforts taken by the central bank uh, to educate the public regarding the importance of transacting with the legitimate financial institutions, uh, we still see these Ponzi schemes are happening. Therefore, general public should be aware of the legitimacy of uh, institutions, they should always deposit their money only in licensed, authorized entities. Another financial crime which was spread very rapidly in the country was prohibited schemes or uh, pyramid schemes. When the surge of such scams was taken place at a fast rate during the period 2007-08, there was no specific law to govern such prohibited sch schemes in Sri Lanka. The Section 83C was introduced to the Bank in Act to combat this economic crime. However, even today, we receive a large number of complaints regarding persons engaged in prohibited schemes in various forms in the country. There are complaints about collecting money, promising to invest even in bitcoins. Another type of financial crime is transfer of funds through illegal remittance systems such as Hawala and Undir. In Sri Lanka, authorized dealers in foreign exchange are the licensed banks and authorized money changers. Remittances through illegal channels is an offense punishable under the Foreign Exchange Act. Those are financial crime occurred in the informal sector. Now let's look at the formal financial system. A robust compliance system is very crucial to prevent such crime taking place in licensed entities. 
although our banking sector is relatively stable, we see recurrent failures in the finance company sector. According to the investigations conducted into business affairs of such companies, it can be observed that criminal misappropriation of public funds is the key reason for their distress situations. You may have seen such reports in the recent <coughs> as well. The regulatory authority can't monitor each and every transaction of a financial institution. Regulators' duty is to ensure that financial institutions conduct their businesses subject to prudent norms and practices. However, in the absence of effective compliance system, it is difficult to prevent occurrences of the misuse of public funds through various frauds. Another element related to financial and economic crime is the growing instances of money laundering. Uh, we know this was brought to the heightened attention of regulatory authorities after Easter Sunday bombings. Financial institutions are very vulnerable uh, to money laundering and financing of terrorism. Uh, Sri Lanka was placed in the grey list of Financial ta uh, Action Task Force in 2018 due to the lack of effectiveness in implementation of anti-money laundering laws. So the problem was not that we don't have laws. The problem was with the compliance. As the President's Council also mentioned, Financial Transaction Reporting Act requires to have a separate compliance officer at each financial institution for anti-money laundering purposes. Uh, not only the financial institutions, but also the designated non-financial businesses and professions are required to comply with these laws applicable to combat money laundering and financing of terrorism. Banks and financial institutions uh, need to take measures to comply with reporting of suspicious transactions and cash transactions. Due attention need to be paid always uh, to, towards the red flag indicators. We have seen the gem and jewelry trade, real estate property agents are more vulnerable to money laundering. Another key concern is the increasing trend of cyber crimes. Actually, financial service landscape is facing challenges emanating from rapid technological advancements. Fintech companies are invading the traditional financial intermediation. The central bank is taking measures to ensure that along with the financial innovation, regulatory framework is also evolved to take timely action against financial crime. Stealing millions of dollars from the Bangladesh Central Bank account maintained in the bank at, in New York is one recent example for a cyber crime. During the COVID pandemic, we all know there has been an increased demand for digital transactions and online banking. Online customer onboarding is innovative step towards financial inclusion. However, identity theft, card fraud, Phishing emails are frequent instances where customers are put at risk. The most recent trend has been online lending platforms. The Payment and Settlement Department of the Central Bank is frequently warning the public not to share their secret financial and personal information such as PIN numbers, passwords, OTP numbers, etc. with these unauthorized operators. It is paramount to strike a delicate balance between technological development and financial innovation. We need to harness the potential of technology while mitigating their dangers. Otherwise, there will be more room for sophisticated financial crimes. For example, digital currencies may facilitate anonymity, which leads to help the bad guys. Financial institutions need to have robust internal operational controls in place to fight against financial crime. Otherwise, they will become weak links in the system. Their risk governance structures and compliance systems need to be upgraded constantly to tackle this crime. Let me also highlight another key element of the strategy to combat in financial crimes. It is the need to have efficient and effective coordination among regulatory and law enforcement authorities. This, this should happen at the cross-border level as well. 
in the absence of efficient and effective law enforcement against financial crime it is difficult to create a deterrent effect against such criminal activities another fact which requires the attention of authorities is the need to enhance expertise and competence of investigation officers when criminals are using very sophisticated methodologies to commit crimes it is important to have uh, required professional skills to conduct investigations into such criminal activities in advanced jurisdictions uh, they recruit civil professionals to financial investigation bureaus and intelligence services i think sri lanka too should consider these measures in enhancing the effectiveness of legal framework against financial crime forensic audit skills are crucial requirement uh, and machine learning artificial intelligence and technology automation should also be used by law enforcement authorities in conducting investigations in fact financial crime is a global problem therefore all stakeholders have a fundamental responsibility to protect the integrity of financial system financial institutions need to expand their enhanced due diligence work to detect criminals this is something beyond your normal kyc policies financial system and regulators need to be always one step ahead the criminals financial crime risk management should be a crucial part of integrated risk management framework of a financial institution fight against financial crime need to be a, way, a key component of organizational culture the fraud prevention needs to be a common objective throughout the organization at all levels sound risk risk governance frameworks to fight against crime should be a prime responsibility of board of directors of every financial institution and also efficient dialogue between industry and regulated authorities is important to ensure right safeguards are in place to combat financial crime it should be a very holistic approach regulator does not need to see tick box legal uh, legalistic approach to financial crime compliance the compliance officers should not be police officers they should be strategic business partners of a firm in mitigating these risks the general public should also be aware of the harmful impacts of these financial frauds i think enhancing financial literacy through these types of seminars is therefore very important uh, let me stop at this point i am happy to take questions during the q and a thank you thank you nishadi odu thank you very much for that insightful uh, thoughts and ideas from the regulators perspective and also to the general public on the financial crime uh, risk they are uh, facing in this uh, especially in this situation uh, in these close situations uh, as uh, not only locally as well as globally and also it but it uh, has uh, the impact on the financial system stability as well so uh, we'll put uh, get the questions at the q and a se session Uh, let me uh, now move on to uh, Sanjay, uh, who's joining with us from Hong Kong. Sanjay, hi, hi, Chaya. Hi, Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay is joining with us from Hong Kong, and thank you very much for joining with us, Sanjay. On uh, and also, Sanjay has a very, uh, as uh, Uma explained, a lot of experience in the international banking arena, especially in the area of uh, international sanctions. So, I would like to focus your attention uh, for the benefit of the uh, listeners here. Uh, can you explain what are these international sanctions we are talking about and also what is the risk of non complying with these international sanctions as well as the impact in terms of the sri lankan context for non complying with uh, these international sanctions in the banking sector as well as corporates you know importers exporters who deal with uh, overseas for their lot of uh, uh, many number of international national transactions if you can explain in a brief manner i know the sanctions uh, sanction uh, sanctions legislations are like uh, it's a 
whole lot of thing, uh, entire landscape, but uh, very briefly, you can explain it to us. Thank you. Over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, uh, Chaya, and, and thank you uh, to the BASL of Sri Lanka for inviting me uh, for this uh, session. And good evening to everybody. So I will provide a quick introduction on international sanctions and also uh, the possible implications of uh, potential violations and also how uh, we could look at mitigating the risk and also uh, finally uh, the, the uh, why we should consider the sanctions risk in the Sri Lankan context. So uh, sanctions is a popular international or foreign policy tool, I must say, that's used by the international community where all uh, other diplomatic efforts have failed. Uh, and while sanctions are inherently uh, political, it is a key uh, tool or a fundamental tool used uh, to combat financial crime. Uh, sanctions have grown, uh, especially uh, after 9-11, uh, uh, especially to combat terrorism uh, financing. And, and uh, I must mention that all these financial crimes are interconnected. And if I just take one example on how uh, one is connected to the other and how sanctions would come into the picture. So if you take uh, like terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda or, or ISIS or Hamas or, or, or uh, international drug traffickers or even hackers involved in uh, uh, various online scams from Russia or China, etc., or even uh, uh, bribery by various public officials, right? So all these are ill gotten gains, and we also have. Uh, uh, international uh, finance, uh, sorry, uh, uh, crime syndicates involved in various crimes. So all these uh, ill-gotten gains, they'll uh, want to use for their own purpose. So they'll, they'll try to bring it to the uh, financial system. So that's where money laundering uh, takes place. But where it's identified that these are uh, proceeds of uh, crimes, uh, so uh, through various sanctions means uh, orders are uh, made to block uh, and freeze assets of these criminals right so so all uh, so that's why sanctions become important so uh, as a result one, once the blocking orders are given and banks uh, freeze assets it's, it becomes difficult for these uh, uh, criminals to use their funds of course they will find ways uh, to do so, but at least through the formal sector, like Nishadi explained, uh, it becomes uh, difficult. So uh, let me quickly uh, touch on who imposes sanctions. So if you look at uh, one of the uh, main international organizations, the United Nations issue sanctions through uh, the UN Security Council. So in fact, in Sri Lanka, uh, like many other countries, UN sanctions are used as, as a minimum uh, in, in each country through uh, the, the financial regulators. So other multinational organizations are also there such as uh, European Union, uh, uh, where you know, uh, those come, uh, become relevant uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, EU countries or EU persons. Uh, sanctions are also imposed by countries like UK or US. And sometimes these sanctions are even more comprehensive what UN or EU may impose. So for example, the US sanctions are very much more stringent and comprehensive uh, when it comes to certain programs that uh, more than what uh, uh, UN has imposed. So there are different types of sanctions. So firstly, we can look at uh, the targeted uh, uh, sanctions where, you know, uh, it would target an individual or an organization or an entity. Uh, and then these parties would be named and published by these authorities as, as sanctioned parties. Then there could be another type uh, on country sanctions. So, uh, so for example, especially uh, the US sanctions sometimes have this effect uh, against certain countries. 
So uh, in effect, basically uh, any dealings with uh, those respective governments or individuals or entities in those countries become uh, prohibited. So it's basically the entire country is under an embargo. So for example, Iran, Syria, North Korea, uh, and, and to, to an extent even Cuba could be uh, classified under this category. Then there are sectoral sanctions where uh, certain sectors or entities are targeted for limited purposes. So for example, in Russia, the Russian oil sector is subject to sectoral sanctions. Venezuela oil se uh, sector is also subject to uh, sectoral sanctions. Uh, another common tool uh, that's increasingly being used uh, by the US is now the export control uh, through the Department of Commerce. Uh, so these are basically prohibitions uh, on various exports, especially dual use goods or sensitive goods uh, to certain countries or entities. So uh, over the past one, one and a half years, we have seen them using this a lot against certain Chinese uh, companies, tech companies. So uh, as a, as an example, uh, the popularly known name Huawei. Uh, you may have heard about sanctions against Huawei. So Huawei is actually under the US uh, export controls, right? Mm -hmm. So we can look at uh, the key risks or implications of uh, violating sanctions. So sanctions uh, may violate international law and also can be a criminal offense and lead to regulatory actions and uh, violations could use to significant penalties and to uh, and also reputational damage to especially to uh, financial institutions so to give an example you would have heard over the past years uh, bnp paribas Pariba was imposed a fine of almost 9 billion uh, us dollars by us hsbc faced a fine of about 2 billion and standard charted more than 900 million. So these are huge amounts. And uh, also what's, uh, what should be noted, uh, penalty is not the only cost. Your reputational damage is even bigger. And also the legal costs involved in uh, remediation efforts uh, and also uh, deferred prosecution agreements that you have to enter, you need to manage those. So the, the costs involved could even uh, be higher. So uh, in, in, uh, in addition, so if you look at uh, from a, uh, a bank's perspective, so if, if, uh, if let's say a, a local bank is considered to be violating US sanctions, their uh, US dollar clearing license from US could be suspended. So uh, these days for a commercial bank, uh, without US dollars being the uh, international currency, it's, it's very difficult to operate. So basically, a bank may even have to close down. And we have seen sometimes certain banks having to uh, eventually shut down. It could have a similar effect on even a company. Uh, but we can talk about how, uh, how a company could also consider uh, these risks. Right, so uh, considering uh, the, the risks I just briefly mentioned, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, both banks and also any company that is engaged in international trade uh, based out of Sri Lanka should be cognizant and mindful of uh, international sanctions because of these potential risks, right? So uh, I will uh, first mention how uh, a bank or, or, a, uh, or a company should take steps to uh, mitigate this risk. So we can look at international standards, like especially the US standards in this regard are considered as the highest standard. So uh, Office of Foreign Asset Control or OFAC has issued a framework with the essential com components of a sanctions compliance program, of course, uh, the, these would take a risk-based approach and, and the components would uh, vary depending on various factors such as the nature 
of the organization, the size, sophistication, your customer base, and, and also uh, your geographical uh, locations. So uh, some of these are actually uh, similar to uh, any other compliance program also like uh, Nish Nishadi mentioned, uh, because these are all part of a bigger uh, compliance framework. So the first component is the senior management uh, sponsorship. Uh, so so uh, ha has the senior management taken a top-down approach to uh, support sanctions compliance? Have they given adequate resources to the uh, compliance units, both in terms of personnel and also uh, required systems? And, and also, is there a compliance culture within the organization? So for in, in any organization, I think for compliance to work, be it a bank or a company, there has, should be a senior management sponsorship for it to uh, work. The second component is the uh, risk-based approach. Uh, so what, what's meant by this is uh, if you take a company, uh, company that's engaged in uh, imports, exports, for example. Uh, it's important to understand what are your inherent risks when it comes to sanctions. So your inherent risks would come through your customers, suppliers, counterparties, your goods, uh, the countries you are dealing with, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's important to understand. Uh, sometimes a company may not understand when it comes to a payment, let's say from Sri Lanka, you make a, a, a USD payment to an entity based in Singapore, but this will go through several banking institutions through uh, different jurisdictions, depending on the correspondent banking requirements, etc. So uh, if you're, uh, so as a company, if you're, uh, considered to be violating certain sanctions, you could be subject to uh, various uh, blacklistings or uh, restrictions. And, and once you uh, get blacklisted or uh, restricted, uh, it's very difficult to get out of it. Like uh, Mr. Indutis, uh, uh, President's Council explained in a Sri Lankan context, how it's difficult to get out of a, a blocking order. Uh, in, you can imagine in the international context how difficult it could be. Uh, there are instances where companies have had to close down because they simply can't uh, manage their uh, payments because of the uh, sanctions implications they have faced. Uh, of course, from a bank's point of view, uh, your risk would depend on, on your customers. Uh, so from a bank side, it's important to understand your customers and also from a trade finance perspective, it's not just your immediate customers, it's your customer's customer, so, right? And, and, and for a company, uh, do you understand if you're importing, uh, from where do the uh, goods actually originate? It's not your immediate counterparty, but who's the ultimate supplier, right? And, and if you're exporting, who's your ultimate buyer? And, and if, it come, uh, if it's shipped, Sometimes the vessel route becomes important because if the vessel is touching a sanctioned port, that could have a certain implication. So it, it can be very complex uh, unless you pay attention to these things. Uh, the third component I would say uh, are internal controls very briefly. Uh, so there should be adequate policies, procedures, and also especially for, for sanctions, required IT solutions. So of course, from a banking side, you need to have a more sophisticated screening tools for to screen your customers and transactions. But if it's just, let's say a, a trading company or, or a multinational company uh, who's engaged so in, in international trade, uh, it doesn't have to be a, such a sophisticated tool, but as part of knowing your customers or conducting due diligence, you could uh, even access the publicly available uh, uh, lists published by OFAC, UN, EU, etc., and conduct a manual search even. So that you, you take some steps to ensure that the parties you are dealing with are not subject to any sanctions, including the countries that are involved. The fourth element is to have a 
audit uh, program to make sure that your sanctions uh, or other compliance programs are working effectively. And finally, uh, the training component, very important uh, because it, to, to give the required knowledge, especially to hire staff in, staff in uh, finance or marketing departments, uh, if it's a company, to educate them on uh, what are the sanctions risks and, and also uh, refresher training uh, so that you know uh, they don't lose that knowledge. Uh, so in, in the interest of time, let me lastly touch on uh, why uh, sanctions risk could be uh, relevant uh, to us from a Sri Lankan context, especially uh, if you take a, a company that's engaged in international trade. Again, needless to say, for any bank in Sri Lanka, it, it's very much a required uh, uh, risk to manage because all banks are engaged in correspondent banking, uh, in, in the sense of cross-border trading and, and also payments. So if we take Sri Lankan context, uh, we are an island. Uh, we depend a lot on, on imports and we do a lot of exports, both for uh, 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 consumption and also for our industries. So there's a lot of cross-border trade. So the moment there's a lot of cross-border uh, trade, sanctions risk is there. And, and also Sri Lanka, uh, traditionally, we have had a lot of dealings with certain regions like the Middle East for our tea or other uh, export products uh, with countries like Iran, Syria, and also we have dealings with Russia and also with China, right? So Iran, Syria are subject to a lot of sanctions. Uh, there are some limited sanctions to Russia and then China, again, because of the uh, increased tensions between US and China, China uh, is, uh, is facing some san sanctions, certain restrictions, especially to the state-owned entity. So when, we come, when it comes to dealing with these entities, uh, and, and those companies sometimes actually, if you look at uh, some of our large infrastructure projects, uh, we have a lot of Chinese investments coming to Sri Lanka. So uh, not that all these companies pose a risk, but it's important if you're dealing with those companies or industries as a bank or a company to be mindful of, of sanctions. And, and uh, lastly, I, I'll say that uh, we are also becoming a, uh, a transshipment hub with the expansion of our uh, ports. So, uh, so that means a lot of goods will start flowing in and out of Sri Lanka, which means uh, the shipping industry will continue to expand. Uh, when it comes to shipping industry, uh, there could be uh, several vessels that are subject to sanctions as well. Uh, and then like I earlier said, the shipping routes, etc could be uh, uh, posing a sanctions risk as well. So, uh, so I, I just tried to uh, sum up, uh, sum it up in 10, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, this is a subject you can talk for days or even have a diploma in it. So uh, I can take any further uh, queries during the Q&A uh, session, Jaya. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you for sharing the uh, your international exposure and experience with us today. And uh, now I would like to join with uh, Dilani, my colleague from Ceylon Bank. Uh, she's a compliance officer, head of compliance at uh, Ceylon. Dilani? Shai, am I audible? Hi, Dila. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Dilani, to the seminar. Uh, now, Dilani, uh, I know uh, you and I share a lot of common thoughts here, but uh, to uh, uh, express all what we do is, is the time is so limited. So yeah. uh, in very brief manner, can you explain to the listeners, uh, as you know, the financial transactions require a mandatory, there's a mandatory legislative obligation on banks to have in a compliance officer, especially looking at the money laundering aspect. 
uh, in from your experience in the bank, can you explain how this is uh, being implemented, uh, especially on what are the requirements on getting the customer due diligence uh, information, the KYC information, and how challenging it is, and also uh, how would you uh, look identify a suspicious transaction what are the methods you would be using uh, and when it comes to money laundering what uh, what types of um, uh, suspicious transactions would you see basically the basics of such, such transactions and what are your challenges in uh, complying with these requirements uh, if you could explain that uh, for the benefit of the people who are joining from the financial sector specifically. Okay. Uh, we heard about the legal framework and also we about, heard about the regulatory framework in Sri Lanka. As we all know, uh, financial crime is not something which, which is exclusive to us. It is a global crime. Uh, so combating financial crimes at global level, there are set standards and based on that stemming from those global standards as the President Council and also Nishad has explained, we have a legal framework and there are certain regulatory expectations. The regulator has asked us what to do and what not to do and what are their expectations. As you said, you have heard the expectation from the regulator, from the banks. I will uh, uh, speak about uh, from a bank's perspective. Uh, it's very high. It's very challenging. Challenging. The regulate uh, complying with the regulations itself is a very challenging role. Uh, so, as banks, how are we going to? Uh, how? What is the setup in banks to uh, support the broad objective of combating financial crimes? If I briefly explain, at banks we have uh, basically twofold. Uh, framework, two-fold framework. First is at customer onboarding level. Uh, second is after onboarding the customers. So at the customer onboarding level, we have the banks do rigorous evaluation of the customer to ensure we onboard only the right people to the banking, uh, towards the banking channel and reject the others. To do that, as regulators also explained, First, we do the screening of the customer. Sanjay explained how important the screening is and how complex the screening uh, is. So when it comes to an individual, we have to screen and see whether it's an individual uh, or a company, uh, a legal entity. We have to screen all the stakeholders. So in when screening, we have to ensure the customer we onboard is not appearing in any of these sanctioned list. If it is an incorporated or unincorporated body, the banks are expected to screen all the stakeholders in this entity. If it is a company, the directors, uh, the major shareholders, the beneficial owners, the persons having the controlling authority, everybody have to be screened and ensure that these are clear people before we onboard them. And we have to collect whole heap of information from the customers uh, in terms of complying with CDV regulations uh, set by the uh, Central Bank of Sri Lanka. So we have to check their names, addresses, where are they coming from, what are they doing, how do they earn money, and what sort of uh, channels of the bank will be used during the relationship with uh, the bank. Uh, and if it is, uh, 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 let's say, a uh, charity who are the people uh, governing that charity, the, uh, uh, and if it is uh, a company who actually who, uh, holds the control of that company, and even if it is an individual, is this the exact person who wants to open and maintain the relationship with us? Or is there anybody behind this person? If is this person is just a representative, just a mule of that of another person, another criminal who is opening this account because it's a real challenge in the present day context to identify who exactly whether the people, the persons who come to the bank are the real owners of the money routed the, through the bank. 
and uh, doing all these things uh, collect by collecting all this information we first get ourselves satisfied okay this person is good enough to uh, offer a banking relationship once we onboard that customer the next step is to watch that customer what exactly is the customer doing is he doing what he has declared to us so to do that we have to have a rigorous monitoring and observing process so all banks have to have these processes and we do implement uh, transaction monitoring uh, while using uh, certain softwares i think many banks almost all the banks have their own softwares and other tools to uh, monitor and uh, identify uh, if there are any uh, suspicious transactions and uh, in addition to monitoring whenever a customer perform a transaction banks are expected to do transaction due diligence this is very 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 important let's say it may be a small uh, cash deposit it may be that is the very basic way of doing banking transaction if the customer brings a large amount of money which he he is he usually do not bring to the bank so bank has to ask uh, as the president council also explain uh, the source of funds from where he has got the money and all that and let's say it is an inward remittance before crediting the funds to that customer's account there we are supposed to check who is the sender of these funds what is the relationship between the sender and the beneficiary and why he has sent this money all those information banks are required to collect and let's say if it is outward returns so it may be with regard to an importing some something but bank is expected to collect all sort of supporting documents to ensure the bona fides of that case because if we don't do that if we just pass the funds it will get stuck as sanjay said earlier in between and the foreign bank the other part before giving the credit to their account of their customer they will ask lots of questions and these funds also uh, route through our correspondent banks so if our correspondent bank observes or feels that this bank is not doing their due diligence properly they just collect money and they just send the funds out so that will be a huge adverse impact to the correspondent banking relationship of the customer of, uh, of our bank so may uh, doing ensuring we do the proper required transaction due diligence is a very key requirement and a very important role the bankers have to play because it directly has an adverse impact on the sustainability of the bank profitability of the bank so it it affects the numbers of the bank not only the reputation it also affects the numbers then the reputation of the bank so uh, if i if i explain uh, it further when we do this transaction monitoring and when we do this transaction due diligence either at the front end of the bank or at the back end of the bank if we see any suspicion if the customer is uh, not in a position to provide the adequate information if the customer uh, is reluctant to give because there are certain customers who, who who are very reluctant to provide the information they ask back the questions from the staff why do you need all these things this is my money why can't i deposit this into my account this is my money why can't i send it out of the country so that it is very very challenging to the bank staff uh to ensure uh, compliance with the cdd rules and collect all these information and protect the bank while satisfying while balancing the customer so striking a balance between the compliance requirements and the business needs of the customer is extremely a challenging uh, it's it, it, it's a challenge it's a challenge if chai you ask about uh, identifying uh, strs the common uh, methodologies or the observations uh, actually during the recent past we have uh, observed lot of uh, cash deposits into accounts uh, using um, non face to face channels uh, using uh, 
uh, cash deposit ma machines using uh, safe transfers uh, and all that. They use the new channels which have been introduced by the bank for the convenience of the customer to do to commit illegal activities. So the common uh, observations are those. So whenever we observe uh, such unusual patterns which are not in line with the declared profile, we as expected by the regulator raise suspicious transaction uh, reports with them for them to take further action and see whether these transactions are actually related uh, to any un unlawful illegal activity. So it has been a common observation as you all know that banking channels have been heavily used during the recent past for drug trafficking activities using these channels, CDMs and set transfers and over the counter cash deposits and all that. Uh, in addition to that, other when it comes to broader challenges, as you all have ex explained, financial crimes are evolving. So they are getting the, the trends are changing day by day. They use different, different channels because we identify one channel and we put controls on that. Then they go and find another channel to do these illegal activities. So the ever evolving nature of the financial crimes. Uh, uh, so how, how competent we are to identify these things of the readiness of the banks uh, is something which uh, we face as a challenge these days because to fight against these type of ever improving methodologies, we have to have resources, resources, uh, human resources, and also non-human resources in terms of uh, systems, tools, and softwares because the criminals are, as explained earlier, criminals are very, very, very intelligent. So uh, we also have to be equally intelligent enough to identify them and catch them. Uh, so having adequate technological support is very, very vital and it is a challenge. And uh, we, have to, uh, we have to always see how we can use artificial intelligence, machine learning and such type of sophisticated tools to identify and trace these type of uh, unusual methods. And, on top of that, we have to ensure our staff are well, well skilled enough. Our technical skills of the staff, improving the technical skills of the staff is very, very important. And uh, one of the challenges which I see is uh, for compliance staff, uh, there is no minimum qualification level or a requirement imposed by the regulator, required by the regulator because regulator has uh, given in detail the expectations, but if the regulator can support us by uh, introducing some sort of minimum requirement as you all have done uh, to treasury uh, staff. Uh, so that will be very helpful to improve and uh, make our staff ready enough to uh, fight against these financial crimes and ensure uh, compliance with the regulatory aspects. Uh, and uh, another challenge which I see is lack of coordination among certain law enforcement authorities because there are a lot of law enforcement authorities we uh, deal with relating to uh, financial crimes. We deal with, firstly, we deal with FIU, then CID, uh, then TID, Terrorist Investigation Unit. In certain cases, we uh, deal with presidential commissions. So the banks are requested to submit the same amount of information, same set of information to all these entities, uh, which is extremely a challenging task to the banks. So if there is more coordination between these authorities, that will be very much helpful to uh, the bank to uh, reduce the burden. And I think uh, there are instances where we do not get uh, assistance, uh, expected level of assistance from other foreign counterparties as well, because there are certain uh, 
instances where we need to get if let's say if it is a foreign investor who wants to bring some money to the country we do not know much about that investor but that investor has banking relationship with a foreign bank of course so and if using the privileged communication if he can get some input from that foreign bank what is the nature of the relationship they have what is the standing and all that because we we do banks do write to those banks and request such information but there are delays in of getting that and also if we can get some assistance from the foreign uh, uh, foreign law enforcement authorities or foreign fius through our fiu uh, of the financial standing of that customer let's uh, because this this requirement uh, is it becomes very vital when it comes to foreign investments because there are a lot of people who make inquiries to bring a lot of money for various investments in sri lanka so if we can get that uh, feedback from those respective authorities of the financial standing of the customer whether this customer has been reported to these foreign if i use of foreign law enforcement authority if they can give some sort of clearance it will be very much helpful to ensure that we do our due diligence because regulator wants us to do enhanced due diligence depending on the complexity of the transaction uh, and the complexity of the relationship so these type of assistance is very very vital for us to ensure we do our due diligence activities uh to the satisfaction of the regulator and also which is adequate enough to identify any financial uh crimes uh those are the challenges chair which i uh, want to thank you uh, yes. thank you dilani for sharing uh with, with us the challenges uh, you are facing as we well last communicate balancing uh, uh, striking the balance between the business uh, uh, customer as well as the um, compliance and the regulators expectations so uh, having said that now we have arrived for the q and a session and now we have got few questions uh, i may post these questions based on the uh, subject uh the first question uh the first question i can post this to uh forward this to uh president uh, nalinda in the thesis uh, sir uh, so this question is for you uh shall i read it uh, i'll read the question heroin sambandha parikshana ekadi heroin samaga vishala mudalak athadangota ganna avasthawaka sakakarota ema mudala labima pilibandawa pahadili kala nohaki nam අධිචෝදනා ගොනු කිරීමේදී මුදල සම්බන්ධයෙන් වෙනම මුදල් විශුද්ධීකරණ වැලැක්වීමේ පනත යටතේ අධිචෝදනා ගොනු කර නඩු පැවරිය හැකිද නැතිනම් අපරාධ නඩු විධාන සංග්‍රහය පනතේ 425 වෙනි වගන්තේ යටතේ එකී මුදල රාජ සන්තක කිරීම විෂ වර්ග අබින් සහ අන්තරාදායක ඖෂධ පනතේ 54 ආ වගන්තේ යටතේ වන අධිචෝදනාව යටතේම ඇති නඩුව පවත්වාගෙන යාමද නිවැරදි so this question Uh, is for you sir you yeah. can i i will uh, answer that question in singhala uh, yes then prashniya wanne heroin na vatali magadi e samagama e heroin santake taba gatta putgala ekka mudal thiyena etukota vatali ma සන්තකයේ තබා ගැනීමේ චෝදනාවක් යන අවස්ථාවකදී විකිණීමේ චෝදනාවක් යවරින් දිරීමේ චෝදනාවක් ඉදිරිපත් කරන්න සාක්ෂියක් නැත්තම් ඒ මුදල් ඒ පුද්ගලයාගේ මුදල් හැටියට අපිට තීරණය කරන්න පුළුවන් එතකොට අපිට ඒවා හෙරොයින් විකුණන ලබා ගත්ත මුදල් කියලා චෝදනාවක් ඉදිරිපත් කිරීමට හැකියාවක් නැහැ කෙලින්ම හෙරොයින් නඩුවේ මේ ප්‍රදර්ශන භාණ්ඩයක් හැටියට ඉදිරිපත් කරන්න පුළුවන් නමුත් ඒ ප්‍රශ්නය ඒකේ දැන් එතකොට සල්ලි ගොඩක් තියෙනවා නම් මේ පුද්ගලයාගේ සන්තකේ එතකොට ඇත්තටම මුදල් විශුද්ධිකරණයේ පනත යටතේ යම් සලකා බැලීමක් කරන්න පුළුවන් ඇත්තටම මම අර ඩිලානි කතා කරන වෙලෙත් මගේ ඔළුවට අවධානයට යොමු වෙච්ච එකක් තමයි විමර්ශනය කිරීම සම්බන්ධයෙන් තියෙන දුෂ්කරතා පිළිබඳව එතකොට 
දැන් මුදල් විශුද්ධිකරණ පනත යටතේ එහි තියෙනවා පූර්ව නිගමනයක් මේ යම් පුද්ගලයෙකුගේ අපි දන්න ආදායම යම් පුද්ගලයෙකුගේ දන්න ආදායමෙන් විස්තර කරන්න බැරි මුදල් ප්‍රමාණයක් ඒ පුද්ගලයා සන්තකයේ තියෙනවා නම් උදාහරණයක් වශයෙන් රජයේ සේවකයෙක් ගත්තොත් මන්ත්‍රීවරයෙක් කීමවත් උදාහරණයක විතරයි මම මේක කියන්නේ මන්ත්‍රීවරයෙක්ගේ පඩිය කීයද කියලා අපි දන්නවා එයාගේ වත්කම් තියෙනවා ලඟදී අත්පත් කරගත්ත වත්කම් තියෙනවා විශාල වත්කමක් උදාහරණයක් විතරයි මම මේ කියන්නේ එතකොට ඒ ඒ පුද්ගලයාගේ පඩියෙන් සහ වෙනත් ඔහු ඩික්ලෙයා කරලා තියෙන ආදායමින් පෙන්වන්න බැරි නම් ඒ වත්කම් එයා ඒ කාල සීමාවේදී කොහොමද අත්පත් කරගත්තේ කියලා එය අර ප්‍රෙඩිකේට් ඔෆෙන්ස් එකකින් ඒ කියන්නේ යම් අපරාධයකින් සොයා ගත්ත වරද මුදල් කියලා පූර්ව නිගමනයක් තියෙනවා මුදල් විශුද්ධික ප්‍රාන්තයේ තියෙනවා ඒ පූර්ව නිගමනය එතකොට අර ඔප්පු කිරි එය එසේ නොවේ කියලා ඔප්පු කිරීමේ භාරය පැවරෙනවා විත්තියට පැමිණිල්ල කිසි දෙයක් ඔප්පු කරන්න අවශ්‍ය වෙන්නේ නැහැ මං ඒක කනෙක්ට් කරනවා විත් විත් දිලානිස් තින් where you said investigation is difficult of course i understand when the when when international uh, uh, banks are involved they don't cooperate they don't give the information they always tell sri lanka to take action diligently but nobody helps sri lanka in uh, in in the conduct of activity uh, investigations um, but if if you find some money with a person which cannot be explained by his known sources of income the presumption starts operating then then it is money derived or realized from unlawful activity it could be uh, bribery it could be any of unlawful activity means it specified in the uh, interpretation there are lot of unlawful activities section 35 if you look at the act uh, it could be arms sales heroin uh, bribery all that again niti virodhi kriyavan kiyane eka panate mudal vishuddhi karana panate sandahan karala tiyena vividha aakare varadawana den etakota eyage santake tiyena na mudal ara mama kiyapu udaharane wage eyage saamanya banku pota gihilla vimarshane karoth මාසයකට රුපියල් 200ක් ගන් 500ක් හරි ලක්ෂයක් හරිනම් දාලා තියෙන මෙයා ගා මිලියන 20ක් විතර එක ළඟ තියෙනවා. ඒකට අවුරුදු ගානක් එයාව ඉන්වෙස්ටිගේට් කරොත් එයාගේ සන්තකයේ තියෙන්න බෑ මෙච්චර මුදලක්. මොකද එයාගේ ආදායම ඊටම අඩුයි. සමහරලාට එයා සමෘද්ධිලාභීකුත් වෙන්නත් පුළුවන්. ඒ වගේ තත්ත්වයක් තියෙනකොට එයා ඩික්ලෙයා කරලා ඇති සමහරලාට මගේ ආදායම මෙච්චරයි කියලා. එතකොට එවැනි තත්ත්වයක් තියෙනකොට මේ මුදල මේ නීති විරෝධී ක්‍රියාවකින් උපයාගත්ත මුදලක් කියලා මේ ප්‍රිසම්ෂන් එකක් තියෙනවා පූර්ව නිගමනයක් පනතෙන් ඇතුළත් කරලා තියෙනවා එතකොට ඒ නීති විරෝධී ක්‍රියාවකින් උපයාගත්ත මුදලක් නොවේ කියලා ඔප්පු කිරීමේ භාරය පැවරෙනවා විත්තියට පැමිණිල්ල ඔප්පු කරන්න ඕනේ මෙච්චර මුදලක් තිබ්බ මේක තමයි මෙයාගේ නෝන් සෝස් ඔෆ් ඉන්කම් කියන එක විතරයි එතකොට මේ ප්‍රශ්නේ අහපු ඊටම මේ හොඳින් ප්‍රශ්නය අහලා තියෙනවා හෙරොයින් නඩුවටත් දාන්න පුළුවන් රේඩ් එකේ ගිහිල්ලා අපි හොයාගත්ත සල්ලි තමයි මේක කියලා ඒ වගේම තව චෝදනාවක් ඉදිරිපත් කරන්න පුළුවන් මුසල් විශුද්ධිකරණේ පනත යටතේ එතකොට පැමිණිල්ලට ඔප්පු කරන්න තියෙන මේ පුද්ගලයාගේ දැනගෙන අපිට දැනගෙන තියෙන තොරතුරු අනු මෙයාගේ ආදායම මෙච්චරයි මේ මෙච්චර මුදලක් එයා සන්තකයේ තිබ්බා එතකොට පූර්ව නිගමනය අනුව විද්‍ය ඔප්පු කරන්න ඕනේ මේක අන්ඩෝෆුල් ඇක්ටිවිටි එකකින් හොයාගත්ත මුදල් නොවේය කියලා. මගේ මතය නීතිපතිතුමා වෙන මතයක් ගන්න ඉඩ තියෙනවා. Thank you sir. Uh, we have uh, several questions but I don't think the time permits us to take us through the all the questions but I sum them up and uh, bring one or two questions back to the um, eminent panel here. Uh, one question is that uh, Uh, i'll post this question to uh, nishadi uh, this is on finance companies 
uh, Nishadi, it says, in reality, most finance companies fail to meet capital adequacy requirements and provisioning is avoided through various manipulations in last minute accounting arrangements. What steps can central bank implement to avoid these malpractices, which effectively are financial or corporate crimes? Nishadi, uh, if you can take this question and uh, give some insights to that, please. Yes, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, finance companies are governed by the uh, Finance Business Act. So in terms of the Finance Business Act, failure to comply with the rules and uh, regulations issued under the Finance Business Act is a ground for cancelling the license of a finance company. So we all know that failure to meet the capital requirement is a major uh, non-compliance. So one thing is we can uh, cancel the license. And this act has very comprehensive resolution regime uh, when finance companies are in uh, these type of financial distress situations. For example, in terms of section 31 of the act, the director of the uh, department of supervision of non-bank financial institutions can submit a report to the monetary board informing that this particular company is not in a position to meet their obligations. In such event, the monetary board can take a decision to uh, suspend the business for six months. So after the six months, uh, subject to terms and conditions, either business can be uh, resumed or else that company will have to be uh, liquidated. Now we know we have, um, uh, there's a huge competition in our finance company sector because there are more companies. Everyone is fighting for the same cake along with the banks. So therefore we are a small market. That's why they are uh, facing very, uh, these financial uh, distresses. So now uh, central bank has stopped giving new licenses to the finance companies, but in the existing companies also, we have a, a traffic light system when a company's amber zone, uh, we get the board of directors to submit us a, a time bound action plan. How are they going to meet the capital requirement? So if, if they fail to comply with that, as I said, uh, we can cancel the license. And uh, or if su after suspending for six months, if still they can't meet the re uh, capital requirement, definitely it will be liquidated. And when it comes to the um, uh, criminal activities, uh, mis misappropriation of funds and other uh, offenses by the board of directors and KMPs, uh, key management personnel, uh, this uh, new Finance Business Act is very strong. We can take criminal and as well as uh, civil actions against the board of directors and the key, key management persons, even against the past directors. Now, uh, in consultation with the Attorney General's Department, we have actually already taken measures to uh, prosecute uh, several board of directors because uh, I, I, we know that in terms of the deposit insurance policy, uh, if a company uh, fails, uh, the depositors will get maximum 600,000 if the company doesn't have assets, uh, depositors get only 600,000. So we can't let the board of directors go scot-free. Therefore, uh, civil and criminal action can be taken uh, normally, we do that through the Attorney General's Department in consultation with the Attorney General. Uh, we can take civil and criminal actions. We can suspend their properties. We can go after the properties of even the spouses, family members. So those provisions are there in the Finance Business Act. I think you lift uh, the corporate uh, veil. Sir? I think no, you sir. lift the corporate veil and go after the directors. Yeah, exactly. This yeah, in the act, sir, it says uh, if it is a body corporate, automatically board of directors are liable. So then they will have to bring the defense uh, to prove that uh, what they did uh, to prevent the occurrence of such uh, uh, violations or the breaches. Yeah. Yes. It's in a under the Companies Act, also there is a liability if you can't go as a going concern. Yes. Solvency test if they don't pass. Now, if they don't have adequate funding, means that they don't pass the solvency test. Director, so company sector also, I think they are liable. Yeah, I think we have uh, under the, uh, the Finance Business Act, we have submitted various investigation reports to the Attorney General's Department. I personally believe we, we need to prosecute because then only uh, there will be a deterrent effect uh, to raise alarm against this uh, criminal misappropriation of funds. Actually, that has been the key reason for 
failures of most of the finance companies in our country. They siphon the money out of the country. Exactly. Uh, Nishadi, there's one more question. If you can give a brief answer to this, uh, is there any mechanism between the central bank to assist uh, banks to recover fraudulently transferred money cross-borderly if the money is still available in the creditor account? If you can give a brief answer to this, uh, Nishadi. That means that uh, if uh, inward remittance has come to somebody's account. No, I think they are, they, this is an uh, outward remittance, outward. I think. That, yeah. mm -hmm. If yeah. the money is being held in a uh, overseas account, okay. whether the central bank can intervene to get that money back? Uh, that is somebody, uh, the Sri Lankan resident has uh, transferred. Yes, yes. I, I, I believe the question is the Sri Lankan resident has transferred the money uh, cross border. Yeah, if the money is still available in the credited account with that, whether the central bank assists the banks to recover that money. Yeah, it, it is like when it comes to in you know, outward remittances. We know in terms of the foreign foreign exchange act, uh, our capital transaction is not fully liberalized. Only the uh, current transactions are liberalized, yes. and all the outward remittances should happen through uh, licensed bank authorized dealers. So yes. then, other other way is the hawala system that not through the illegal systems. So when we yes. have. Uh, evidence the uh, actually financial in the in, uh, intelligence unit also can intervene to conduct investigations uh, we have entered into mous with uh, foreign uh, uh, financial intelligence units if it is through illegal uh, path uh, we will have to have international uh, of, uh, collaboration of the international uh, regulatory authorities if it is through a bank i think then the remit the remitting bank is a sri lankan bank so first we will have to uh, check with the sri lankan bank on what basis that money was transferred because there are permitted transactions and uh, transactions which have not been permitted like making big investments in uh, foreign countries uh, current transactions are you can uh, purchase uh, goods and services for those payments you can transfer money out of the country through banking system uh, so fraudulent trans uh, transfer mean that if a that is then there is a collusion uh, with the customer and the remitting bank as well because uh, if it is a fraudulent transaction through a bank it is a violation of the foreign exchange act and as well as a direction issued under the uh, banking act i think i had an instance uh, this might be helpful where a uh, person uh, working in Dubai, uh, allegation was that uh, he has defrauded the employer, remitted over a period of several years, money to Sri Lanka. Yeah. And uh, he came to Sri Lanka, he was happily waiting here to find the central bank has frozen all his accounts. And uh, in fact, the FIU, with the help of the CID, had even uh, uh, in, entered uh, um, uh, orders in the land registry preventing him from transferring even the properties because there had been a complaint from the Dubai police uh, through the central bank, I think their central bank, to our central bank and the FIU and the CID. So similarly, I think if there had been a predicate offence committed here, money has been out remitted outward to some country. I think we our we our mechanism also can make the request to that country, provided of course there is an agreement between this that country and us, uh, and get uh, monies uh, the. Payment of money, operation of the account stalled. Yeah, um, when it comes to you have to prove the, uh, through a bank, as I said earlier, there are perm list of permitted then uh, which are not permitted. That like capital transaction is not fully liberalized in our country. Uh, the current transactions are liberalized. So when bank banks are emitting money out, they need to know the purpose, and there should be a documentary evidence to support the request as well. In the absence of such documentary evidence, maybe for health requirement for anything, education purposes, living per expenses, there should be documentary evidence. In the absence of such evidence, banks are not supposed to uh, authorize yeah. the outward remittance. 
um, from my practical experiences, uh, if if a foreign bank uh, suspends funds, which is being sent to uh, uh, through Sri Lanka due to whatever reason, which is not known to us, it's very difficult uh, to for any of us to get intervene and get the money released because we don't know for what reason it has been frozen there. Maybe it is regulatory, this thing, or uh, it can be a bank's internal policy. So most of the time it can be their law enforcement authority has frozen the funds over there, uh, which may be uh, either a financial crime or that person who's receiving money can be, uh, it may be subject to some kind of a uh, legal uh, action over there, so which is not known to us. So it is very difficult for a local bank to get back the money if it is frozen at, uh, at the other end. Getting back the money will be difficult. Yes, getting back the money from overseas is very difficult. So there's one another question. Uh, this is for Sanjay. Uh, if Huawei opens an account in local bank, are they allowed to conduct transactions involving USD under the US import sanctions? I think Sanjay, this is based on the new restrictions on Huawei. Uh, if you can answer, give a brief answer. We are like we have gone over the time as well. Sanjay, I think the connection is Sanjay is not clear. Uh, if you guess on, if he connects, we'll go ahead with the answer. Uh, yeah, there's the one more problem with oh, okay, Sanjay. Sorry. Yes. So I'll give a very quick answer to that. So the answer is there is no problem to uh, open an account for Huawei, uh, even in US dollar. They can even bank in US. The restriction is basically on exports from US. So, uh, so Huawei is added to a, entity, uh, a list called the entity list under the Bureau of Industry and Security coming under the Commerce Department of US. So there are many other entities also uh, in, in China that has been added to this. So uh, the restriction is uh, certain goods coming under the export administration regulations of US uh, cannot be exported to these companies uh, without a license. So it, it's not just goods, it's goods, any, com any goods that contains US components, US technology or US software. So it's very wide. Uh, so that's the only restriction. Uh, so banking, giving them other banking facilities or conducting US dollar transactions or opening accounts, there's no uh, restriction or prohibition from a US sanctions person. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, there are two questions, but both of them are same. Uh, Dilani can answer in very brief manner. This is asking, what they're asking, what are the threshold levels or flag levels uh, of transaction in an account to alarm compliance? And the other question is, internet bank transfers to an account, what is the limit likely to raise a concern with compliance in Sri Lanka? Dilani, if you can give an insight as uh, there are, yeah. uh, there are the thresholds. We, we cannot impose a common uh, threshold level because the threshold level will differ from customer to customer, customer category to uh, category. There We can't uh, tell about a very common threshold or a flag because for example, let's say if it is a uh, housewife or a student, uh, the red flag will be there if that housewives or students, uh, the, the housewife will be getting uh, remittances uh, from uh, her spouse who is employed about on a monthly basis within a certain range. But if all of a sudden, if the remittance, if she gets a very large remittance, uh, which is far above what she has been getting so far, that is a red, red flag. Uh, but that amount may be uh, within the normal uh, uh, profile of a corporate customer. So likewise, we cannot think of very common threshold limits uh, but that will depend on the customer profile, actually. Yes. Uh, Same applies to, to uh, inward yes. remittances and outward remittances as well. Yes. There are different ratios which are being set depending on the bank's needs and depending on the segments of the customer. So these are not regulatory thresholds, uh, but looking at the uh, risk appetite of the each bank, uh, there are, these systems are 
uh, have different types of rules where different types of thresholds are set. So there is no one particular threshold as given, but there is a mandatory reporting threshold to the FIU, uh, which all banks and all financial institutions has to submit uh, that threshold reports. But internal monitoring is depending on different types of transactions and different type of customer segments. Uh, if uh, there's one more question, uh, this is for um, President Council, Mr. Indati, sir. Uh, sir, uh, when, uh, this question is, can foreigners legally own property in Sri Lanka or was Mr. Indati, sir, referring to the diaspora? I think based on your um, real estate uh, related uh, question, uh, clarification, this question has been uh, raised. Sir? No, I was referring to in, uh, two things. Investment made by foreigners in local companies. That is uh, where money has to come through CR accounts. Or CR, whatever. Now, now, it's, uh, yes, now yes. it's inward investment accounts. Uh, um, uh, inward investments have come through inward investment accounts. Yes. Now, when uh, they are uh, when money has to be brought through an account, sometimes the foreigners bring money as cash and deposit into local bank accounts of the companies. There could be a problem if the central bank is alerted. So whoever is advising a company has to advise that if, uh, if money has to come for a share investment, it has to come through an inward remittance account. So yes. that is what. With regard to purchase yes, of property by foreigners, I am of course not a notary, I am not very conversant with that, but I think uh, uh, they can buy now, that subject to correction, they can buy, but uh, their stamp duty amount is very much higher than a local purchasing uh, property. Yes, if I may to add on that, uh, foreigners can buy under the Land Alienation Act on uh, apartments uh, above the fourth, fourth floor. Yes. Uh, other than that, they can't own properties uh, down uh, on the ground under the Land Alienation Act. What about the land? I think the question was on land. land uh, normal ground land, they can they can't buy. It's yeah. only apartments above. That's also above fourth level. Fourth level, yeah. Yes. And they have to bring the money definitely from overseas. They can't take loans to buy that land, uh, buy that property from here. Yeah. But, uh, and also any company which if, if, if there's a shareholding or above 50% by the foreigners, that company is also considered as a foreign com foreigner so that they also can't buy a property here, down here. If the... Uh, uh, Percentage is over and above fifty percent by owned by the foreigners. Thank you. Okay, there's one question, but this is not very clear. But what I think is trying to ask is: uh, recently, it was revealed that millions of money have been deposited to the personal account holders, but it seems that the banks have not informed it to the relevant authority. Any reason for this? I think this question is not very much clear. But uh, what he's trying to ask if large amount of money has been deposited into personal accounts, whether why it has not been, uh, we don't know about the particular instance where he, that he's talking about, but it's if definitely that if it is uh, in, uh, not within the profile of that particular customer, then definitely the bank should have been informed. But if it is uh, the money, which is for an investment purpose, and if the money, uh, they, what the bank, uh, uh, investors have brought in, uh, the bank is satisfied with the source of fund, there is no reason for the bank to report it. Just because the money is coming uh, and it's being reposited, uh, banks are not supposed to report, they are supposed to do the due diligence. And based on the due diligence, if we are not satisfied only, we have to report this. But since the answer uh, question is very not clear, we, well, I don't think the answer should be posed to anyone. And all, I try to answer that question. So all if answer... To, all, uh, Chaya, uh, yes. Chaya, anyway, even if there is no suspicion, 
under the normal fortnight reporting requirement, if it is above yes. 1 million banks, anyway should report. Anyway, so anyway also we, would have report. No, we would have done the yeah. normal reporting. Yeah, normal reporting would have definitely been done yeah. if it is above the threshold. But uh, as a suspicious transaction, it will uh, happen only if there is a suspicion based on the profile of the customer. So I think uh, we are about to wrap up this. All the questions have been asked. We are like we have taken more than fifteen minutes over the time, and uh, it shows the interest in uh, this session. Uh, thank you. Uh, to uh, sum up, we discuss on the uh, legal framework governing the financial crime uh, aspect uh, within the context of Sri Lanka, specifically giving attention to the money laundering and the financial transactions in, uh, reporting act. Yeah? And then we discussed uh, with the Nishadi, the regulator, from the regulator's perspective, what are the uh, areas that they are uh, looking at the financial crime, uh, especially on the pyramid scheme, Honda and Hawala and so on and so forth, and what the action they have taken uh, with, uh, to ensure the financial stability that the, uh, financial, the money uh, uh, circulating within the country is not produced through different fraudulent activities, which has an impact on the financial sector's integrity. And then we discussed uh, with Sanjay, who given very uh, in, uh, insight uh, views about the international sanctions and what have the what it has the implications in terms of local uh, Sri Lankan context. And then Dilani gave us uh, insight. Uh, what are the challenges imposed by? Uh, what are the challenges? Uh, in, uh, faced by compliance officer when looking at getting the customer due diligence information as well as the monitoring of transactions and also dealing with the law enforcement authorities. So uh, I thank you, uh, the eminent panel here joining with us today. And also I thank uh, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for organizing this seminar. And I wish you everyone a good night from uh, moderate, from my point. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Uma.